The theme of today's event is library spaces as research and cultural infrastructure. Um, following a previously successful event on this topic, this session is going to look at further discussions around the integral role of library spaces as research and cultural infrastructure and the requirements for designing spaces to fulfill this role. This afternoon, we'll be hearing case studies from the universities of Sheffield, Glasgow and Royal Holloway, and they're all going to showcase how libraries respond to the challenge of designing or redeveloping spaces to provide the infrastructure that supports scholarship and learning, how they can bring communities together and um, facilitate encounters with our cultural heritage collections. So, Without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Vicky Grant, who is the Head of Learning, Library Learning and Teaching Services at the University of Sheffield. Um, and Vicky is going to be talking to us about um, the findings of an AHRC RLUK Professional Practice Fellowship project on the creative library, Liberate the Library. Thank you, Vicky. What do you think of when you hear the word library? Maybe a place of dusty books where you cram for exams or somewhere that houses knowledge from the privileged few. What if the library could be more than that? A space to follow your curiosity and try out new forms of knowledge and technology to connect and to listen, to enable all voices to be heard. The digital commons here at the University of Sheffield Library is a space for students to connect collaborate, create change, and use innovative technology in the process. Work with other students from a range of courses on causes that matter. Make your voice heard through regular events scheduled around liberation themes like Black History and Pride Months. Apply the knowledge you are learning to new media. Access a range of digital and creative kit for free. Express your creativity through poetry, storytelling, and collage. If you want to meet inspiring people, create knowledge, and be an active innovator, visit the Digital Commons today. To find out more, visit bit.ly slash creative library dash students. So hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Vicky Grant from the University of Sheffield, where I'm head of library learning and teaching services. And I'm going to be talking today about how we've developed an academic library makerspace called the Digital Commons. Um, at the University of Sheffield Library through a lens of library liberation. So our digital commons is within this building here. So this is um, our information commons, it's our student library, it's open 24 seven, it's over seven floors and our digital commons has been reimagined. It's on um, level one of the information commons. So uh, just to summarise the contents of my presentation, I'm going to be first of all talking about library makerspaces in the context of the philosophy of knowledge. And then I'll give an overview of the digital commons so you can see some images of the space. Um, and then I'll give an overview of the Creative Library Project, which as Fiona said, is an AHRC Research Libraries UK um, Professional Practice Fellowship Project. And then I'll talk a little bit about how this fits with our strategy, particularly around the University Library's information and digital literacy framework, and also our comprehensive content strategy. Um, and then I'll touch on how we're sustaining and scaling our work through an initiative called uh, LibFest. And then there's some references for people to follow up and then questions, but I think we'll be taking questions at the end, actually. Um, so we'll just start talking uh, first of all, about library makerspaces and the philosophy of knowledge. Um, <clears throat> and when we're thinking about decolonizing and liberating our libraries, it's really important that we attend to the philosophy of knowledge um, and broaden the epistemologies or ways of knowing that we consider valid in our university libraries. So Sarah Ewing, on her work on decolonize, decolonizing academic libraries, articulates how Western principles of positivism and universality have colonized knowledge through a bias towards propositional knowledge. So propositional knowledge is the traditional knowledge of Western universities, of Western modernity. It's based on intellectual theories and a reductionist approach. 
In her work on teaching to transgress, Bell Hooks problematizes theoretical knowledge when it's used to set up unnecessary knowledge hierarchies, which then act to enable epistemological domination. So library makerspaces have the potential to disrupt the domination of Western propositional knowledge by creating a space for other ways of knowing. Inclusivity requires that makerspaces are developed through a critical lens, which attends to power distribution through minority communities. Epistemological justice requires extending epistemology through cooperative inquiries, where propositional knowledge is extended to include presentational, tactical, and experiential ways of knowing. And I'll just say a little bit about what these Four Ways of Knowing. So this is from work by Heron and Reason, published in 2008, um, who've categorised four ways of knowing. So propositional knowledge, as I've just said, is the knowledge of Western modernity. It's knowledge that's held within intellectual theories. It might be something like the findings of a randomised control trial. Um, presentational knowledge is is narrative-based knowledge. It's the knowledge that's held within stories. So that might be through poetry, um, life and creative writing, collage, um, art-based knowledge. Practical knowledge is skills-based knowledge. So it might be something like the skills to use something like a 3D printer would be considered practical knowledge. And then experiential knowledge, which might be known as knowing rather than knowledge, involves being present with another knowing through the immediacy of perceiving through dialogue and in the moment encounters such as those found in a library-based collaborative space. So traditional university libraries have had a bias towards propositional knowledge, the type of knowledge that might come from something like a systematic review of control trials Cooperative inquiries require that we move away from this bias, away from knowledge hierarchies toward, towards something that's more inclusive, a more inclusive epistemological approach where different ways of knowing are all included um, and seem to be complementary rather than hierarchically ranked. So I've got a question for you to think about now. Can our libraries reach beyond propositional knowledge to incorporate presentational, practical and experiential forms of knowledge? through cooperative inquiries in a library maker space. So that's the question that we've been exploring as we've developed our library maker space, the digital commons, through the project called the Creative Library Project. So this is an image of the digital commons. Um, as I've said, it's a physical maker style space in the information commons, um, and it brings learners creativity and digital tools and skills together in a collaborative space. So we've been reimagining the digital commons as a maker space, but with an ethos of keeping the focus on the commons. So as you can see from this image here, um, the main part of the room is filled with circular tables because we wanted to keep this ethos of collaboration, keep the commons at, at the center and the digital tools are located at the side of the room in breakout rooms. <clears throat> so this is the breakout room for 3D printing. Um, you can see Jack here from my team setting up the 3D printers. Um, and the image on the right there is some 3D printed fidget toys that we made to coincide with Disability History Month. We also have a breakout room for digital stitch craft. So uh, you can see our embroidery machine here um, and a digital sewing machine. Um, and then this is some imagery of turtle stitch, which is some software that we've been using to develop um, creative coding. This is to just show you the virtual reality that we've been developing. <clears throat> we don't have a virtual reality room, we do the virtual reality events actually in the main part of the digital commons. Um, and we've developed a critical artificial intelligence offer as well um, around general generative AI literacy. This is our craft cupboard. So our offer blends high tech and low tech. Um, we think the most important thing is the dialogue, the critical dialogue, the students coming together. It um, doesn't really matter whether it's high tech or low tech. So I'll just say a little bit more about the Creative Library Project. So the aim of the Creative Library Project um, is to develop the library's digital commons through a lens of library liberation. 
um, the objectives were to collaboratively organise workshops focused on digital creativity and aligned with the liberation priorities of our students. So we've worked in partnership with the Student Union Liberation Officers um, to organise workshops aligned with Black History Month, Disability History Month, Reclaim the Night and LGBT Plus History Month. We use the change methodology of appreciative inquiry um, integrated in with participatory action research um, as our methodology. And as I said, we worked in partnership with the Students' Union Liberation Officers to develop our digital commons. So we were funded in part by the AHRC and Research Libraries UK Professional Practice Fellowship Scheme, but we've also had funding through Research England, through our participatory research network, and also from EATL, which is the International Association of University Libraries. And as I say, the approach that we're taking is to be people-centred, um, to co-produce between librarians and students, to digitally enable the information the information literacy offer, but put in the commons first, the people first, then the literacy of creativity, and then bringing in the digital tools and skills. Um, so the Creative Library Project is an information and digital literacy project that brought library literacies and library spaces together. So the literacy of making in a library makerspace, I think quite often when people think about makerspaces, they're thinking about the space, but we were careful to think about the literacy and the space coming together. So as I said, we worked um, in partnership with our Students' Union Liberation Officers, um, and we also employed a team of, of five library student associates, um, and we partnered these with librarians so that all the workshops were um, co-planned, co-delivered and co-reflected on um, by both librarians and students working together. <clears throat> so the Creative Library Projects enabled us to invest time and money and deep thought into developing our digital commons through a lens of library liberation. Um, phase one launched in October 2023, um, and we're positioning students from marginalised groups as knowledge creators in our university libraries. Reimagine our library as a space for making as well as discovering knowledge. So the librarians and the team of library student associates partnered together to co-facilitate the creative workshops in our digital commons. Um, so just some examples of things we did um, included watching a VR documentary on Grenfell before the fire. Our lead library student associate was an urban studies student, so she facilitated this. So that's how we use the VR headsets during Black History Month. And then we had a discussion and made collage on the theme of home and housing inequalities. I mentioned the fidget toy making that we did on the 3D printers for uh, Disability History Month and then um, for um, LGBT History Month, we did a clothing upcycle uh, for Pride using the digital sewing machines. Um, so I mentioned our student union liberation officers. So we've been working with them. This is our fourth year now. Um, so Shona Tullett was the first liberation officer. She started in 2021 and we formed a really strong partnership with her. Um, and then when Grace Cleary took over, um, there was a handover and we formed a partnership. And then Tomas is the liberation officer for last year and this year. Um, so these continuities allowed us to build year on year um, to strengthen our project. So this just gives some examples of the um, kinds of activities that we planned with the students um, in our digital commons. And then these are just more images from our Black History Month workshop. Um, so in the Black History Month workshop, we watched and then made diasporic poetry, um, which is the image on the left. We did some printing and stitching on fabric, which is the middle image. And then I mentioned before about using the VR headsets to look at the um, Grenfell documentary. Um, at the end of our workshops, the students and librarians reflected. So if you're familiar with participatory action research, it moves through cycles of planning, um, an action, so that's the workshops, and then reflecting, so plan at reflect, um, and all of this was done um, to a co-produced approach to reflect the participatory approach that we adopted in our project. <laughs> so outputs from our project, um, we saw the animation at the front, at the start, um, and then we 
got a creative scene as well, which just summarises um, the work that we did. So it summarises the workshops here, a bit of an extract from Black History Month. Um, at the end of the project, we work with the library student associates to um, create a dream for the future. Um, and you can just see here on the right hand side, welcome to LibFest. So I mentioned earlier that LibFest is how we're going to scale and sustain our work. <clears throat> so at the heart of the Creative Library project is the active inclusion of missing voices through digital library making. So we're positioning students from marginalized groups as digital knowledge creators in our university library. And this is operationalizing our information and digital literacy framework and comprehensive content strategy. So this is our information and digital literacy framework. Um, we created it in 2017. It intersects digital literacy with information literacy and recognizes that active learning positions students as um, active creators of knowledge, as well as consumers of information. Um, so it was really important to us to have those literacies of creating and disseminating in our IDL framework. So it was this work that inspired our library maker space, um, but also our library's comprehensive content strategy, which was created by our content and collections team, particularly this principle that they integrated in of inclusivity, which captures this commitment to include missing voices in our collections and wider work. So I mentioned um, how we're going to sustain the project through an initiative called LibFest, which will launch next month in time for Black History Month. Um, you can see a little bit more about LibFest here. So we'll be celebrating the liberation priorities of our students and including previously missing voices in our university libraries through a continued commitment to run creative events in our digital commons. And this continues to be um, a university library and student union partnership. We've appointed a digital commons manager um, to enable us to sustain and scale this work. And a lot of events will now run um, on Wednesday afternoons in the university library because this is our non-contact time in Sheffield for our students. So that's when they've got time to come and do extracurricular initiatives. Um, and that's just our references. And uh, I think we're going to take questions at the end. So that's me finished. Thank you. I'll hand back to Fiona. Thank you very much, Vicky. And indeed, we will be taking questions at the end. So if you've got any questions based on, on that really, really interesting, really inspirational talk, thank you, Vicky. Please do add them into the Q&A and then we'll cover them towards the end. Um, and I also, Krista, love the sewing machine workshop. I think I would uh, probably struggle to be getting much work done on a Wednesday afternoon if you had that running. But anyway, they're very popular. I'm sure they are. I'm sure they are. Um, right. We're going to move on to the next talk, which is on the redevelopment of the main library at the University of Glasgow. Um, and this presentation is going to discuss the latest building project, for the main library at the University of Glasgow in the context of the development of the building over the past 30 years and how it's getting constantly redeveloped to respond to changing user needs. Um, and we have two speakers on this. We have Susan Ashworth, who is the Executive Director um, of Information Services and the University Librarian, and Siobhan Convery, Director of Library Collections, also at the University of Glasgow. Over to you both, thank you. Thanks, Fiona. Um, and hi, everybody. Um, it's lovely to be here. So we're going to be talking about the, the latest building project um, on in our main building, main library building at the University of Glasgow. And this is a, a, a library that's really been at the heart of the university community since the foundation of the university nearly 575 years ago. We actually celebrate our 575th anniversary in, in 2026. So this will be a, a very familiar story for many of you. Um, we haven't been lucky enough at Glasgow to get the opportunity to build a new library. So our history is one of rethinking, revisioning and redevelopment of an existing 60s high rise building. This is a building which had a, a very clear vision when it was conceived. It was designed around specialist subject divisions with subject based library staff. But that vision has had to move and change as ways of learning, researching and behaviours generally have changed over the years and as library services have evolved. 
And the service has, has also moved from one that was very decentralised to a, a very centralised service, largely concentrated in this main library building. Because changes to the building have been made incrementally when money has been available, that overall vision has been compromised. I mean, I think it's interesting to walk the building and see the differences in design, styles, decoration, furniture, some very much of their time. Our Deputy Vice-Chancellor refers to the library as the university's fourth road bridge. It's a, a constant work in progress. Despite all of this, I would argue the building works better than ever today, and it retains its place as one of the most important spaces on our campus. And I think one reason for this is the ownership that our students feel for the building. One of the biggest changes probably has been in the way we manage occupancy and that move from very close control of activity in the building to a, a very relaxed approach. So here are just some images showing the library in its original location on our, our um, West End campus um, to the new building in 1968. So you've got the, the original space, the concept for the building, the construction of the building and the building as it was realised with spaces that reflected the needs and expectations of staff and students at that time. So very much geared towards the individual scholar, silent study and very strict approach to behaviours in the building and very little consideration given to accessibility. Um, as architects like to do, they, they have a, a very, um, um, how should we call it, high level um, um, sort of design um, image and conception. So the design was based on Italian hill towns and marks in the sky, as the architect called it. And it has a very dominating position on the university campus. There is an urban myth that the library was built without taking account of the weight of the books and that it's been slowly slipping down the hill ever since, but sadly that's not true. So our recent projects have focused really mu very much on, on social space or, or on dedicated space, so a cafe, social group study, a postgraduate study space. Um, and the development of the building, the development of new services have gone hand in hand. So we've very much moved away from desk-based services and have created a frontline service reach out, which is the first line of inquiry for our students across all student facing buildings. This is a roving service where staff have a baseline of knowledge and escalation routes for more complex inquiries. When we merged with IT to become information services, we've also taken the opportunity to bring their services under the reach out umbrella and we've located the tech bar in the library. Um, and I would say that recent developments are, are very, very popular. However, they've largely created spaces and services which support undergraduate and taught postgraduate students. So we've been able to redevelop large parts of the building through the discard of print materials, um, STEM journals, through the UK Research Reserve Project, alongside significant investment in electronic back files of those journals. In order to facilitate this major library annex project that I'll come to talk about, this summer we relocated all remaining print journals, largely arts and social sciences, to our off-campus store. And I have to say this provokes some bash backlash from academic colleagues and the articulation of a perception that the library is becoming a space that doesn't support researchers. I don't think that's true, but I do understand the concerns and we do need to take the opportunities offered by this new project to address those concerns. So just because we all like pretty pictures of libraries, I like to think, um, or unpretty pictures of libraries in, in this case, these are some before and after pictures of the spaces that we've been able to create so far. Um, and yeah, you can see the the, the, the significant difference in the quality and, um, and um, environment that's, that we've been able to move to. So the Library Annex project has been allocated £24 million, largely to upgrade the external cladding, glazing and curtain wall. We'll also be able to improve the internal environment and decoration of the four floors, which have been untouched since 1981. And here's just a, a picture of the annex as it was originally. The, the middle picture is um, a, a project that we were able to do about 10 years ago to create an extension. And the third picture is um, a visualisation of, of the annex as it, as it will be after this project is ended. So what is driving the project? Well. The annex is reaching the end of its life. There are lots of end of life um, materials in, um, present in the in the annex. Um, there is a very poor experience internally and, and space is taken up by low use um, collections. 
Sustainability is, is built into the design of this project. So the roof re replacement will um, include a biodiverse green roof and it will significantly improve insulation. We're going to reuse the furniture, the original wooden carrels in the space. And although we'll reduce the footprint of the print collection, we won't relegate all print because we know from ethnographic work that we've done with our students that the library looking and feeling like a library, i.e. with books, is important to them. So we'll reduce the height of the shelving, we'll make it more accessible and we'll look at um, spaces, at layouts to make spaces more attractive. Um, just touching on some of the challenges around this project, um, the University of Glasgow has a, a complex and growing estate. We have a, a new campus um, adjacent to the existing campus in the West End, which has had three new buildings erected since 2021 and has another one planned. We have a, a large Victorian historic estate with many listed buildings, and we have a lot of 60s buildings reaching end of life. So the Library Annex project had to compete for significant funds within this context. And it's successful. I think we were successful in, in attracting funding because the library is a workhorse. It's open 19 hours a day, 361 days a year. It reaches full capacity most days during semester. There's significant emotional attachment for many students and staff, something I think that few other buildings engender. And I think as well, and I think this is true of many, many library teams, um, you know, throughout RL UK and indeed throughout higher education in the UK, there is a credibility around what we do and a confidence in our ability to deliver. And, and so this project is part of a, a programme of projects, which I'm sponsoring, which is looking at, um, which takes another student facing buildings and is looking at creating a kind of neighbourhood in our part of the campus for, for student focused buildings. Because this is our main library building, we can't close it to carry out projects. All project, projects have to be carried out with the building open. And that requires ongoing communication with multiple stakeholders. And, and, and I expect we will get complaints. And the building is also close to a, a residential area. So working with the local community is, is critical. And of course, our relationship with our estates colleagues is absolutely fundamental to the success of this of this project It is a jointly delivered project. And we need their support with managing contractors and, and with contractor issues, some of which we've we've had already. So I'm going to hand over now to Siobhan to talk about some of the opportunities that this project offers us. Thanks, Susan, and good afternoon. Um, yes, and I'd like to to spend a little bit of time now over the next couple of slides, really talking through the the opportunities that this cladding project is going to give us, um, and in order to 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 see how we might reimagine some of the the floor plates uh, in the annexes, and and how we're working with architects and our space planners to develop models and concepts. So as you can see on, on the screen, um, you can see that we've got relatively large floor plates um, over multiple floors that we've got to work with. Um, we're looking to make quite a high impact with some relatively light touch and sympathetic internal improvements. Um, some of the uh, advantages we're, we're looking to take uh, from this project is that we're wanting to maximise uh, on the improved natural light that's going to bathe all of these floors following the reglazing of the entire north elevation. We're also looking to improve low level and ceiling height uh, lighting to create different local atmospheres. Um, of course, that's part of our sustainability imperative, but, but it's also with an understanding of how varying environments can have a major impact on well-being and study success. And Susan's mentioned the furniture. I think it's really important that we can signal with the furniture the different choices of spaces depending on the activity that you're wanting to carry out within the building. So the original study corrals are going to be there to, and celebrated and are going to indicate where we maybe want to work with concentrated working, with maybe lounge chairs for more relaxed reading room feeling. Um, and with an establish, an effort to establish or to, to even to re-establish a distinct palette of furniture um, for the library um, in, in these areas in the library. And, and with an attempt not to kind of mimic some of the one, somewhat interchangeable furniture that I think we might all um, be familiar with from higher education furniture suppliers catalogues. And in doing that, um, we're also hoping that we'll be able to celebrate what is um, a rather lovely mid-century design materials. So that's working with the wood, with the leathers, 
with the concrete um, of the original building to reanimate these uh, and breathe new life into the remaining uh, furniture uh, to, to give back or to, to reimagine the USP of what studying in these spaces um, is about. And Susan mentioned also uh, the, the project's also meant re in relocating a significant uh, amount of stock. That's been just over the summer, about 10 kilometres of stock, um, some five kilometres internally within the existing library footprint and a further five uh, externally to an off-site research store. So what that's allowing us to do is also to build capacity to expand uh, the collection spaces that we have for legacy collections to be brought into the library, uh, to, to refocus on the research collections that have perhaps not been um, visible uh, or as visible. Um, and it certainly allowed us to better orientate and collocate subject collections in the library ahead of the new semester. And of course, we're also very excited about designing space for advanced research activity within with our collections. So over recent years, the university, as, as Susan mentioned, has invested um, considerable millions on an ambitious campus-wide programme of redevelopment. And that's delivered buildings such as a student learning hub, an advanced research centre, a new business school and PGT hub, and a new building for research into health and wellbeing. However, one of the proposed buildings that was on the blueprint, the master blueprint, um, didn't go ahead, and that was a dedicated new arts building. So over the years, um, the library has built confident, sustained academic partnerships, both at strategic and operational levels. And around our older collections, our archives and our special collections in particular, there's been an especially strong uh, partnership with colleagues in the College of Arts and Humanities. So this cladding project has given us both the opportunity to build on those shared ambitions for spaces that are going to support advanced humanities research. Another opportunity that we're looking to maximise is the amount of teaching that our teams do across uh, a number of programmes. We already have a well-resourced seminar room and a special collections reading room in the library, but we have significant new master's programmes coming online uh, on stream in 25, 26, which will demand new kinds of provision, provision that currently isn't available within our estate. And those are specifically a two-year book and paper conservation masters, a new MSc in library and information studies, which will join our masters and um, museums and our ma um, archives masters. So both these programmes, these are new programmes, as I say, have been designed with the library's input. And it's building on this dialogue and engagement that we've had further collaborative meetings to workshop ideas, to co-design spaces, services, and the kind of environment needed to support advanced humanities research. So just some of the ideas that we're exploring um, are collaborative study spaces, spaces that go beyond um, the reading room and seminar room environments, to support work with collections and smaller class groups, dedicated spaces, for example, for student placements, visiting research fellows, honorary creators, and for some of our jointly appointed staff. Also building on an earlier EHRC CAPCO award for microscopy and cultural heritage science, we're exploring ideas uh, for an advanced digital imaging suite, which would be kind of extensible spaces in which people can learn, research and experiment with digitization technologies. This would be a space that builds on our existing conservation lab and digital uh, digitization studio spaces, with facilities to enable multimodal imaging, multi and hyperspectral imaging, two and 3D imaging and microscopy. And we're also looking at what a broader digital humanities suite might hold for researchers and for staff with facilities to support data visualization, XR and textual editing. So huge potential, huge potential for a shared vision and clear value um, both for the library, for its collections, and for our academics uh, to develop these spaces, but they are still at a very early uh, conceptual stage. So I think we'd just like to conclude with saying that one of the main or the key takeaways that we have is seeing that this project, this cladding project, is very much an enabling project. And we, we need to see it as more than just a library project. Um, 
throughout this phase and um, this this project and it's been a number of years in the making um student and staff engagement has been absolutely critical not just in terms of the library committee as a governance and reporting and touching base uh, committee but working with our student representative councils over a number of years to ensure that the student voice is at the heart of what we're delivering and that staff as well feel um, part of the, uh, the the development phases as appropriate. And as we move into a more active and delivery phase, that staff, staff drop-in sessions ramp up. And we have a full communication strategy that, that we're rolling out now as well across our university community, as well as, as Susan said, part of our vibrant local community. This is a, a very large and important landmark building, both uh, uh, physically and um, emotionally and as well and, and physically in our campus, as I say. So it's important that we bring the many communities that use and neighbour us uh, along with us over the next two to two and a half years. And I think um, I see uh, the the value of the the library to the university is 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 writ large, um, with the 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 size of investment that it's that it's committing to this project over the next couple of years. Thank you. I think the first that I actually want to start with, um, it, and this is a question for both Naomi and for Vicky which is how you promote, um, in Vicky's case, the digital commons, but in Naomi's case, the interactive books, for example, and the various exhibitions. How do you promote these with students? How do you reach students that may not think that they're, as you know, that generally might be less engaged with those sorts of activities? Naomi, shall I go first? <laughs> Um, for us, it's all about leadership. So it's about positioning the students from marginalised groups who might feel that the library is perhaps not a place where they belong or have traditionally felt that they belonged as the leaders of change. Um, but having said that, we've tried to adopt participatory approaches wherever we can because I've seen, seen quite a few student leader projects or projects that are perceived to be co-production projects where the students kind of go off and do amazing things. But then because the staff weren't really involved, they can't really sustain the project. So for me, that's why it's really important to take this partnership approach where we partner librarians and students from marginalized groups together, um, but give them as much freedom as possible, listen to them, incorporate their ideas. So we've been planning for next year's Black History Month workshop, for example, and the new, Black and Ethnic Diversity Student Union Officer. I'd got some ideas for events that she was going to run actually in the Students Union, but we invited her to incorporate those into the event that we're running in the Digital Commons so that she's got this sort of sense of leadership and ownership. And then through that, what we found works really well is that those students, um, because we have a team of six in Sheffield um, Liberation Officers, then um, promote what we're doing to um, their networks. So positioning students as leaders of change, I think, is really important and giving space to those students that have traditionally not been involved. Thank you, Naomi. Yeah, um, well, and for me, we, we try very many different avenues, I think, and, and I think I think that's the kind of the key. So we, as you've seen, we've worked with student societies. We also encourage lecturers to program um, work into into their modules, into their teaching modules, and that's actually been super effective um, with some of the for the exhibition space, for example, with um, doing a few of our shows with um, sort of STEM. Um, subjects and, and that has been a way of bringing audiences and, and students that might not necessarily have thought that collections and exhibitions are kind of within their wheelhouse into the spaces uh, and kind of stoked stoked that that interest um, and, and reach those audiences. I also think that we benefit from, from that kind of high footfall um, location for the exhibition space as well. So on some of our comments cards, we get, um, we've often, I've never been in here before, but it's wonderful. And, and um, we get some really moving comments that are about how exhibitions have made people think differently and the sorts of things that they, they might not have gone also to London, to the galleries, to the contemporary art galleries. They might not find that those those spaces are, are spaces that they would necessarily travel to go to and visit. 
Um, but when it's on a university campus, it's in within your own library and there's a shop next door you, and it's open, you might find that they wander in and if we're lucky, leave a lovely comment like that. So I think we are reaching reaching those, um, those audiences slowly but surely. And it's cumulative as well, um, it's particularly since reopening, we've had to really um, sort of work at kind of our relationships with all sorts of um, sort of avenues, ways into engaging with students. Um, but now even our kind of volunteering offer, which I didn't really touch on, but we're kind of ov oversubscribed with people that want to work with us. And, um, and, and that is actually showing from across the kind of um, range of subjects as well, which is really encouraging. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, moving on to, um, I've got a, a question which is still about involvement and how, how we kind of involve other people, but this is for Susan and for Siobhan, and that's around, if you could expand a little bit on the, the project that you have talked about in the context of a neighbourhood and how you've gone about bringing key, key partners into that neighbourhood. Yeah, so... Um... I think it's important that we that we see our library project in the context of the of the whole campus redevelopment and the and the way that the university is thinking about zones within the campus, activity within the campus, and and really importantly for our campus, having spaces that students want to stay. We we have a large commute, commute commuting student population, and there is a sense I think um, amongst our student bodies that we don't provide enough spaces for them to dwell, for them to be, that they don't always feel that they're part of that broader student community. So the, the neighbourhood I'm looking at includes the library and our learning and teaching hub, but also I think spaces we want to create that will be agnostic, if you like, of activity, spaces that students can just be and do whatever they want to do, um, you know, have a have a cup of tea or have access to a kitchen or, or something like that. And it's that kind of that holistic feel, you know, we're, we're trying to approach this holistically and in terms of what does a student do during the day? What is the life in a day of a student? What kinds of spaces might they need during the course of that day? And what might be then attractive to them in terms of how they relate to and stay on the campus? So that's that kind of neighbourhood view that we're, we're trying to look through. Um, and, um, you know, outdoor space is important within that as well. You know, how, how can we make mm -hmm. their journeys to and from buildings attractive and easy and safe? Um, so all of those things kind of play into our thinking around this project um, um, and, and how it relates to other work that's going on and around us. OK, thank you. And I mean, kind of touching on that as well, around that, that balance, that obviously that neighbourhood is very much around students and student experience, but you also referenced in your presentation about um, working with academics who may not want print stock to disappear. And obviously when print stock goes, that's how you can create spaces. So um, how did you sort of manage those expectations and those criticisms from academics? And, and you, yeah, how does that one work? Masterclass, please. Oh, <laughs> I wish. Um, <laughs> so, we did have some very strongly expressed emails sent to us, um, um, and um, and that that did demonstrate, and I think it was important for us to hear the strong feeling about about um, from a, from a small group of academics, I would say, but about how important those collections were to them. Now we know those collections are not heavily used; they're not borrowed, but clearly for some people, they're incredibly important. I don't think that means that we should retain them in space that has a really heavy footfall. But but what we did need to do was to do um, a lot of one to one consultation with our academics and, and talk through the kinds of services we were going to wrap around the collections that we were moving out of the building so that we ensured that, that they would have not not the same access. I mean, they couldn't just walk into the building and, and take something off the shelf that they wanted, but we could at least do scan and send. We can bring material back to the building if they want to consult it. So I think it was, you know, a, a mixture of lots of talking, lots of communication, lots of scotching of rumours, but also 
just being clear about the service, that we weren't just moving this stuff out and, and, and dumping it, if you like, somewhere else, that we were doing it in a very managed way and that we were going to create a series of services around that that would ensure that they would still have the same access or equal access, if you like, to the material that they had before might be in different ways, but it would still be there. Mm. Um, I've got a couple of questions around staffing, actually. Um, and the the first is is to Naomi, which is around what size team you have working on the temporary exhibition programme. And I'm going to add a little bit in there and say that you also mentioned volunteers. Um, so perhaps how you're able to expand the team using volunteers as well. Just tell Yeah, us sure. Um, we have a very limited capacity yeah. and I would say not a large enough team to program that space. And certainly our ambition, our exhibition program this year has been potentially more ambitious, um, you know, biting off more than we can chew. We have delivered it, but it's um, it's come uh, at a sort of at a cost in, in terms of how much resource we've um, put behind that. So it, I, there's myself um, across the entire service, and then I have one art, coll art collections officer that supports delivery of the exhibitions. We work in um, collaboration with colleagues across um, the university to manage the space and also outside contractors um, for design. Um, and, but yeah, it is, um, I think it probably would ideally be supported by a large team. Um, but saying that our, our team is augmented uh, as well through not only volunteers, and we try to be very, very careful about the kinds of activities that we seek volunteering help with that, that is going to be beneficial for the students and not just to support kind of core business activities. So that's definitely more kind of skills-based, developing their skills uh, but our placement student program that we do often get pots of funding and um, particularly research funding to support um, and we focus that on doctoral students postgraduate students and they're with us for a period of months in assistant archivist or curatorial roles um, and they do then become a kind of get a bit of everything and I think that's part of the joy and benefit of coming into a small uh, sort of culture team museum and heritage team they do get a, you know place in, in this kind of environment are really, really valuable um, because you get experience across such a range of activity that if you go, went into a larger institution, you might not. And I think within higher ed education institutions, we're really well placed for that kind of opportunity. Um, and, and it's something I think is a bit of a unique selling point for um, museum and culture services within universities and, and what we can offer our mm. students in sort of setting them up for heritage careers that experience experience is what sells is what a lot of museum and galleries and, and heritage sites is looking for and what often they can only really offer for free but with research funding um, that can be used to support placements um, I think that's a, a really really good solution to that problem sorry I went a bit off on a bit of a tangent no, not at all it's, you know, I think we're all fascinated <laughs> by how to fund these amazing um, initiatives. And one of the things that struck me was you, you mentioned about the um, a partnership with the VNA, for example. Um, and in partnerships such as that, are they being driven by, by yourselves? Are they being driven by academics who are doing research in those areas? So where's that inspiration coming from or both? All of the above. There's been a lot of kind of serendipity in the, in, in the sort of delivery of this programme. And we've had to be very responsive, particularly because we were relaunching a programme that was cut short um, by the pandemic. So there were lots of sort of irons half in the fire conversations that had begun um, in the instance of our current display with the VNA we're in the very fortunate position that um, the curator at the VNA um, of theatre and photography is a former alum here, which is, is a really nice connection and also a, another way of showcasing what our alums go on to do uh, to our current student body. Um, so I, I don't think there's one been, there's not an easy answer to that. There's not one route, but we are working on a more kind of streamlined route towards future um, forward planning of the space. And that's really the next kind of piece 
of work that we're kind of engaging with now as part of a wider kind of arts and cultural framework for the entire university and exhibitions committee to invite proposals, be a bit, little bit more strategic now that we've got through the sort of immediate reopening. We've delivered things and, and finished conversations that we'd started. Um, we really want to secure the future of the space and, and work a little less responsively and a little bit more kind of... Uh, <laughs> Well, yeah, um, in plan strategically, yes. Well, so. I, th I think serendipity comes to those who deserve it. So <laughs> I think that's you. fine then. <laughs> Good way to work. Um, so I think we probably have time for a final question. Um, and actually what I'm going to do is take Chair's prerogative and, and combine two questions in one. These are for Vicky. Um, um, because we've had a question um, from somebody around the fact that you've been able to appoint a digital commons manager and whether or not that's core funded if it's a permanent post and within that I wanted to combine that question around how we engage our broader library staff with um, things like creative libraries when you know they may have a more traditional approach to librarianship so how can we make the most of our current staff as well as being able to employ additional um, staff to support something as wonderful as the creative library. Yeah, thank you, Fiona. Um, so in specifically in answer to the question, yes, it is a core role. Um, it's a permanent role, the digital commons manager. And that was really important because it's important that if we're going to do something ambitious like this, that we know that we can feel confident to sustain it. Um, and the way that we've achieved this change is by... Um, if somebody leaves, perhaps they retire or resign, then instead of just automatically appointing to the same job description, just really thinking about whether we can do things differently. So that's how I managed to persuade my directors um, to sign off this um, new post by so reimagining. But we've done quite a lot of work, actually, probably over the last uh, five years for our information and digital literacy offer. Um, when I first came into post, there was quite a lot of duplication. So even something like showing students how to use the library catalogue, lots of people were developing presentations on how to do that and doing demonstrations. Um, so we've moved to this ethos of do one, share many. So we have quite a lot of digital learning objects. Um, so we appointed some digital resource co-creators in my team who um, make online screencasts and tutorials so that they can be embedded into the um, virtual learning environment, which just means that um, we can be a bit more efficient actually with our time and it opens up those possibilities to reimagine the library and to be responsive to those emerging opportunities. Um, so that's how we've managed to make the change. And then in terms of um, bringing library staff on the journey of change, Actually, with, I've been quite surprised in our library team, just how many people are interested in creativity and being involved and um, being in the digital commons, getting involved using the 3D printers and digital sewing machines. They've been very popular with staff, but we have invested quite a lot in staff development. So we've invested a lot in um, sending, student, sending students and staff to conferences, encouraging the team to present at conferences, um, getting them involved in the change process. So I just briefly mentioned that we were using a change technique called appreciative inquiry, which is a bottom-up approach to change. Um, it's it's based on kind of co-producing a vision for the future. So a little bit like I was saying with the students, I think if someone sees themselves as a leader of change, a stakeholder in that change, that they, their voice has been heard, um, that I think they're more likely to, to buy in um, and own the change. And, and see it through. It's not Thank always you. perfect. 